of hate crimes. You think of hooded sheets and cross burnings. But in the 90s, we've learned to blend in. Hail victory. My name is Ralph Walker, and I want to welcome you to another exciting chapter of the book Beat, Dialogues in Action. And my guest today is Mr. Michael Novick, and he's going to talk about something very special, and that's the rise of hate crimes. Uh, normally on television and other publications, those that are the perpetrators of hate crimes seem to get all the publicity, but those fighting to, uh, let's say, disband it or break it up or inform us how to become involved, get very little attention. So today on the Book Beat, we have a very special guest, Mr. Michael Novick, and uh, pleasure to have you here today. Nice to be here, thank you. And uh, why don't you let our viewers know a little bit something about you, about yourself. Well, I, I think what, it's true that what you said about the publicity mostly going to the racists, unfortunately. Uh, I work with an anti-racist group called People Against Racist Terror Apart. Uh, I'm the editor and publisher, I guess you would say, of our newsletter, which is called Turning the Tide. Now, Turning the Tide comes out how often? Is it, it comes out bi-monthly. Uh, every two months, we've been coming out for five years now. We'll be starting uh, volume six uh, in the January-February issue coming up. Um, and the newsletter uh, is distributed locally and nationally. We have about uh, 1,000 uh, copies that get out, go out in the mail to uh, subscribers uh, around uh, the Southern California area and around the country. As including some that we send out free to uh, prisoners. And uh, basically, we try to do a lot of grassroots work, especially among white people, to oppose racism. Uh, this comes really from the message that came, I think, from the black liberation struggle going back to the 60s, that white people who are concerned about racism need to deal with it within our own community. Take a stand in a sense. Yes. Uh -huh. Now, a, a question to ask, what prompts you to get involved in, in <laughs> something like this when you're talking about fighting a... Uh, a, a tremendous uh -huh. uh, cancer in society, racism. Really? Well, on a personal level, I was in college in the 60s. Uh, I went to a public college in New York, Brooklyn College, and uh, at that time, uh, it was 98% white school in a borough of Brooklyn, which was uh, about uh, 40 or 50% black and Puerto Rican, and the, the uh, contradiction of that just came home to me. Uh, I didn't feel like I, I, that I could live with it and accept it, and so I became involved in struggles at that time, and I've try to sustain really that involvement. I feel that, that uh, these are the survival issues of, of our time, not only for black people or 
Native people or Asian people, Latinos, but for everyone people on the planet. Overall. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would ask what type of parents did you have to, <laughs> because that plays a major part in education of anyone. Uh -huh. What type of home did they come out right. of? What type of home? Well, did I, I was raised as an Orthodox Jew. My parents are, are still Orthodox. I'm not. But, uh, you know, I, I think what I took from that value system is a belief that uh, uh, in justice and in, in uh, human dignity and in trying to uh, live up to uh, certain moral ideals. Uh, I, I don't think any one uh, religion has any monopoly on those ideals, however, and uh, I would have to consider myself more of a humanist today. Now, to reflect back on the uh, skit that yes. took uh -huh. place uh, <laughs> prior to the, the uh -huh. show, uh, most people think of hate crimes as people in the white sheets and, and hoods on and, uh, and that Hollywood image. Right. That may be true in some parts of, of, of the states, but it has changed somewhat, hasn't it? It definitely has changed. I think you find that the, uh, the hate groups are, in a sense, the tip of the iceberg now, and they have learned a lot of lessons about how to sink roots, unfortunately, even deeper. Um, there are definitely consolidated hate organizations, but most of them no longer wear the sheets. Uh, Tom Metzger, for example, who was once the head of the uh, Ku Klux Klan of California, now has an organization called the White Aryan Resistance and has kind of led the way in this idea of having a sort of clandestine mentality that they will not come out in public. He, he has a cable TV show, for example, and he gets on broadcast television all the time, but most of his people are much more secret in their activities and not uh, out in public with it. And so he will draw people in with his cable TV activities and with his speeches and uh, appearances on broadcast television. For example, uh, Whoopi Goldberg recently started a uh, interview show. One of her first guests was Tom Metzger. Right, And right. Uh, I think this is very unfortunate. It's kind of what you said. They give millions of dollars worth of free, free publicity to these fascists, basically, who then recruit people in right, to right. The, 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 this operation. And uh, they have a whole series of issues that they uh, work in the framework of single issues around, uh, you'll find Klansmen and, and neo-Nazis participating in the anti-abortion movement. You find them working around uh, in what they call the Christian right wing, uh, where they uh, put out anti-gay politics. They, they uh, uh, have gotten real involved in the anti-immigrant uh, activities uh, here right. in California. And in every one of those areas, they pull people in uh, who might respond to that one argument, and then they develop the whole politics of white supremacy. Now to ask uh, a question that um, a viewer out there may be asking, your publication, uh, what do you do? You just report on hate crimes? Or, or well, we're an, activist, uh, we're an activist organization, grassroots organization, and, and so we do education. Uh, I've uh, spoken at many schools in the area, and uh, we have a slideshow that we uh, can present in, in class and have discussions in class with students. We now, what is the subject important. of the, of the uh, slide? The slideshow mainly deals with the uh, history of the Ku Klux Klan in particular, because we think that's one of the uh, uh, sort of quintessential racist organizations in this country and has had a big impact internationally. People might not know, for example, on it's one of the things in the slideshow that uh, Hitler's Nazi party, some of the original founders of the, that were right-wing groups that were based uh, out of Klan organizations in the United States. The Klan was a mass organization in the United States in the 1920s, and a number of German Americans who uh, were active in the Klan then went back to Germany and planted some of the, the seeds that grew into Hitler's Nazi party over there. We see the same thing happening today with the, the Nazi skinheads. All right, so is, is, what do you think keeps propelling this hate, hatred? Well, I, I, I think it is systematic. I mean, uh, our belief is that uh, it's not only these groups, but that uh, a lot of the roots of it are in the whole social system, the history of slavery. Uh, some of that's what, some of what we go into in the slideshow, and the kidnapping of African people, the, the uh, land theft of, uh, of land from Native people and Mexican people, and so on. And, and so this creates a mentality that if you're going to subjugate people and take their land and take their liberty, that you have to say that they're inferior mm -hmm. because if you respect yourself or another person you couldn't do that to them so so that's where you get the genesis of this kind of racist ideology and and and, uh, and then it gets inculcated from generation to generation people well, have to justify why so many young people you see, yeah. uh -huh. why so many young people involved in skid right. organizations and the, embracing Nazism and fascism not just here in the United mm -hmm. States but throughout the world why so many young people you think that the is this something that the school system is not doing is something missing in history I, I think there's definitely a failure in in uh, people's understanding of history I, I think that the public education system doesn't uh, really teach truth to people 
And so uh, the Klan and these other elements move into it. I think the young people have been inculcated. It's not that they just generated this on their own. But you do see people like Metzger, who has brought up his own children. I mean, his, right. his daughter heads the uh, Aryan Women's League, and his son is the head of, originally it was called the White Student Union, and now it's called the uh, White Aryan Resistance Youth. Now, and do you think he really believes in his philosophy or hate, or is it just a money? You think it's money? Is it? Uh, it's hard to say about Metzger as an individual. I think that you know he, he's made a career out of it, definitely. Right. And uh, you know I, there have been some suspicions about where his money comes from because at one point, for example, there was a um, a member of what was called the Order. It's a white uh, uh, underground kind of neo-Nazi clandestine group which carried out a series of bank robberies, held up a Brinks truck, uh, right. killed a number of people. And one of the members of that group, when they were captured, gave a deposition saying that Metzger and a number of other public white supremacist figures had gotten the money, which I think $30 million was never recovered of the money they stole. So it, I think the money is probably an aspect of it for him. Uh, there's been speculation about why he has been so immune from, from any uh, prosecution. Uh, prosecution, because he's only, the only time he ever served was about uh, uh, two months recently on a cross burning that he did with people who, who started the order. Now, do you think that could be an impact on the uh, judicial system? You having someone like Mercer stand up in front of you, knowing the impact that he has also. He, mm -hmm. he has quite a bit of clout in a sense. Uh, you think that could skip, uh, tip the scales of justice? slightly his way? Well, I, I, I think, you know, unfortunately, the, I, we've seen a lot of incidents recently where uh, justice is not as blind as it sometimes claims to be. The, the, uh, the verdict on the uh, police officers who beat Rodney King, the right. uh, judge who overturned the jury verdict uh, uh, on the uh, woman who uh, shot and killed Latasha Harlins in L.A., and many other incidences where we see that the criminal justice system is mainly seems to be designed to criminalize people of color and, and where it's a question of defending uh, people's rights, or in the case of Metzger and the other cross burners of, of stopping racist terror, we see that that system tends to fall down. So that's why we're more involved in, as I say, grassroots organizing, uh, demonstrations, educating people. We don't feel that we can really rely on the police. For example, uh, Metzger and a number of these other people, there's a man named Dennis Mahone, who is a Klan leader very close to Metzger, who's been involved in trying to recruit uh, LAPD and probably other police departments around uh, the county into the Klan. I think the, in the Rodney King uh, 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 scenario, or whatever you want to call it, it was called the Rodney King chapter, and the four officers, I believe they uncovered a, a lot of Klan or race hate material out of the Foothill Station. Is, is that At true? At the Foothill Station, I know there was a, a black woman officer who, who had been harassed and, and uh, Klan calling guards who left in her car, and many, many other incidents. We, we have a, a report, actually, that we put out called the Blue by Day, White by Night, which uh, is about a 10-page report documenting many, many incidents locally and nationally of organized white supremacist involvement in law enforcement groups. And uh, this is a very troubling trend. And, the, and these uh, Klan, uh, one of the things, when they take off the robe, sometimes, unfortunately, they're in uniform underneath it. Right. And uh, you know we've seen cases of prison guards, military police, uh, many, many other uh, uh, cases. So our, our concern, as I say, is to really reach into the white community and try to uproot this before it, it sinks deeper roots, and especially with younger people. Now, the slide presentation, if there's a, a teacher out there or uh, uh, someone else associated with mm -hmm. education of young people, uh, the, all they have to do is contact you and... Yeah, they could call a part uh, where, uh, I guess you'd have to call it an, uh, an anti-profit group. Uh, we, we, okay. We're not in it for the money, I can assure you of that, definitely. Non-profit. But uh, we, have a, uh, we have a, a hotline, anti-clan hotline, which is 310-area uh, code 288-5003. And uh, our uh, P.O. box is uh, in the Burbank area, P.O. box 1990-1990 so in Burbank. If, and people could write to us or call us. Now, if they see a hate crime being committed or they know of Definitely, we would like to get information on that. We, we've uh, been involved in uh, a host of activities like whiting out racist graffiti. We've gone on paint outs where people's homes or neighborhoods have been vandalized or people put up swastikas or KKK uh, slogans. and like that. We've uh, helped uh, repaint the home of a, a black family in Orange County where there was a cross burning and vandalism of their house. And uh, we try to do concrete uh, actions that will involve mm -hmm. people in, in creating a, a culture that tries to transform this kind of racism. We were involved in doing a Rock Against Racism concert and also in Orange County with some young people down there and have been talking with people in the Inland in Empire. In Orange County, they yeah, had a uh, uh, Rock Against yeah, in, in Racism. Uh -huh. 
How's so, that uh, yeah, so in other words, we, we feel it is a, a, you know, Pat Buchanan talked about a cultural war, and, and you see these people taking power, really, in our society, and we feel it is uh, on that level that uh, we need to develop the, a, a, a culture of resistance and a culture of, of, of solidarity. Do you, do you think that it's a, a case of too many people sitting back watching rather Definitely. than direct involvement? Definitely that's the case. And a lot of people take this uh, sort of hands-off attitude and they say, well, just ignore them and they'll go away. And I think what you see in Germany now uh, is just proof again that that's impossible, that, that, that uh, if you ignore these uh, fascists, uh, what happens is that they sink deeper roots and, and uh, fester, uh, you know, uh, uh, and they do get the publicity one way or the other because they have supporters in the media, they have supporters in the government that will promote them. And so if people of goodwill and people with decent feelings don't take an active role in trying to oppose it, it only grows and worsens. Mm -hmm. That's good. So the Good Samaritan gets very I guess small so headlines, for the season, uh -huh. and those that cre yes. uh, mm -hmm. create the hate crimes get the yeah. headlines uh, in a sense. Uh, we, we were just involved in a series of demonstrations out in Simi Valley where you know people tend to associate Simi Valley with the, the verdict of quitting the police officers, but uh, there have been a number of white supremacist groups trying to organize out there, the result of which is many people in that community have been outraged by it and by the original verdict. And uh, we've had uh, two major demonstrations there with uh, four or five hundred people, many, many local residents coming out to oppose these Klan's people. But the media coverage has been terrible. The media consistently have devoted most of their attention to uh, letting uh, this guy, Richard Barrett, for example, the head of the nationalist movement, speak and present himself oh, yes, as a great patriot. Oh, yes, that was on television. Right. right. And uh, we, you know, we watched all the channels, local and national affiliates, CNN, and they all have the same uh, approach to it, which is to give him a chance to spout his rhetoric and appear nonviolent and appear that he was only pro-America and pro-white and anti-immigrant and, and refused to cover any of the uh, many, many speakers that we had in, in, in a countervailing demonstration and also refused to really put out the information about the violence that Barrett and his people had been involved in. There was a, the next day after the first uh, demonstration they had in Simi, they went down to the border for a thing called American Spring at the Mexican border. They actually literally stoned Mexican migrant workers. One of the not Nazi skinheads with Barrett drove a truck at the counter demonstrators and ran over a banner from, I think, uh, one of the Mecha chapters at a so, so then the, the Not to cut you. Yeah. So then the image uh, mm -hmm. across the airwaves is like uh, Simi Valley supports uh, hate groups. Right. You get this idea that, you know, this man is speaking for somebody when he only had one person come out to support him. We had 500 people to oppose him, but he's the one who gets on the air. So I think it's very positive <laughs> that you're putting the anti-racists on, on a show for, for a change. Well, it's something long overdue. Mm -hmm. I think basically uh, people at heart uh, prefer to deal with a problem in a nonviolent way, contrary to the image that are displayed. Now, the question I was going to ask you also is hate crimes are not just black and white. No, by no means. I mean, I mentioned that incident on the border. And, and unfortunately, I think one of the things we found here in L.A. is that there's a lot of antagonism between different groups that are oppressed by a system of white supremacy. But people fight over crumbs. And so our message, we don't think it's only directed towards white people to say that we have to work together in solidarity to transform things and, and create better relations among all groups in the society. Um, you know, we, we uh, are opposed to anti-Semitism. We're opposed to attacks on the Arab community. We, uh, we've uh, uh, opposed anti-Asian violence. And uh, we see that it has to be a consistent struggle. What do you think of the Palestinian question? Uh, myself, I think what's going on, for example, now in, 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 uh, with the deportation of the Palestinians is a terrible injustice and that uh, uh, this government, unfortunately, has for decades uh, supported that whole system of, of colonialism there, the same way that we see colonialism here against Native people or the U U.S. colonizes Puerto Rico. You find the same thing in the Middle East where the Israeli state has been colonizing the Palestinians. So, uh, you know, we're, we're opposed to colonialism in all its forms, and we think that uh, inevitably the colonizer also becomes dehumanized by it. I, that's one of the, I mean, if you look, for example, at what's going on in, in Serbia now. Right. The Serbians, I think, had legitimate complaints about the Croatians. Croatians. The Croatians had, had uh, collaborated with the Nazis during World War II. Right. But, but the fact that they were victimized then, they've turned around and become the oppressor now. 
to where they, they, they've set up concentration camps themselves. They're attacking the, the Muslim uh, uh, Slavs in, in Bosnia. And the essence uh, becoming like the enemy. Yeah. So, taking uh, on the ways of the enemy, uh, mm -hmm. something that uh, Dr. King always talked about, not becoming that way. To, right. Uh, and that's something we try to struggle with. I will say, in, in other words, when we oppose the Klan, we try to do it in a way which is not hateful because we're not interested in becoming the mirror image of some of these Nazis. I mean, they're constantly calling us up and trying to make it like a personal, uh, you know, let's knock heads, and, and we're not interested in that. We don't, you know... It, it, they look for physical confrontation? Definitely they do, and, and uh, you know, have harassed people and gone to their homes and so on. Our, our approach is that we're trying to deal with the social problems and the systemic problems, and we think any individual can be redeemed if they want to give up. And we've seen it. Many, many people have left the Klan as a man named Ken Peterson, for example, just recently, who was one of the leaders of the Klan in the Midwest and created a united front of, of Klan groups and eventually saw the error of his ways, has left the Klan, has turned over uh, massive amounts of information about uh, white supremacist groups around the country to anti-Klan organizations. What do you think prompted? What one incident would make someone that's a staunch Klan supporter, organizer, suddenly see the light? Well, I think it's a fundamentally wrong-headed belief, and, and, and if you have any respect for yourself, really, I don't think you can hate other people. And these people are always saying, oh, they're just for white pride and white power, and they mm -hmm. love white people. But the fact is that they don't, because the proof is that if they did, they, they wouldn't be such haters. And I think if any bit of love will kind of infect you, and I think that's what people are so afraid of, around some of this stuff that they just must maintain the racial barriers at all costs. So, you know, I, I think, uh, um, you know, there is a possible for, possibility for redemption even in the worst uh, Klansmen. We're not interested, in, therefore, in, in, in dehumanizing him either. Mm -hmm. But he's got to uh, mend the error of his ways, and, and we're certainly welcome to and have received information at times from people who, you know, were caught up in this and said, well, I, you know, we want to let you know what's going on, and we're any of those people would like to happen to catch this and want to call in and you know we could talk to them too but uh, our approach is sure how does a person like you stay alive <laughs> now, you, you survived the uh, Ronald Reagan era uh -huh. the George Bush era uh, you have to been up under uh, some Daryl Gates uh, surveillance I, I mean, well, I'm sure they have files on me. I, you know, I, I feel like you can't worry about it. I, you asked me how old is part, and, and the particular impetus that started me was a visit to my home by an FBI agent and, a, and a, the LAPD coming out of their turf to just to harass you? talk to me. And, and I, I felt like, well, if I'm going to get harassed and I'm not doing that much at this moment, I better get more politically active. That was my feeling mm -hmm. about what else can you do, you know, the best defense is a good offense. All right. So, and currently there has been a lot of harassment of part by these neo-Nazis, as I say, but uh, to us the solution is to be more active and sink deeper roots and, and build more support. And uh, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and, and uh, you know, your viewers and the audience here. We, we, we've done a quite a bit of work actually in Pasadena. Um, last year there was a, a lot of activity here by the Populist Party, mm -hmm. which is another one of these front groups for the, the Klan and neo-Nazis. The head of it is a man who's based down in the harbor area named Joe Fields. but. Uh, they were running meetings here at Pasadena City College and uh, around the community, uh, you know, disguising again mm -hmm. what they were about. So we, again, we were not trying to get them kicked out of the libraries or out of Pasadena City College, but we had some counter demonstrations to let people know what they were really about. And we're not saying they can't speak or, you know, weren't trying to shut them up or shut them down, but just to let people know, pay attention to who they really are, what they're really up to, because they're very dangerous and that kind of public organizing always leads to racist violence, racist terror, and we, we can't allow that chain of events mm -hmm. to, to now, continue. What, what's happened to the John Birch Society? You don't hear too much of that. You don't hear too much about them. They, they, it's kind of interesting, actually, during the Gulf War, the Birch Society is one of a number of right-wing and, and, and far-right-wing and racist groups which attempted to infiltrate the peace movement. They were coming out with a lot of close to anti-Semitic stuff and, and, and saying that Israel was manipulating the United States and that the Jews were behind everything. And they attempted to take that out into the, the broader uh, opposition to the Gulf War. And uh, we put out a report at that time called Wolves in Peace Clothing about uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Klan, the Burt Society, uh, Lyndall and Rouge, a number of other groups that were doing that uh, while vigorously opposing the war ourselves. We said people need to be aware that you know, who you make alliances with, because if you're going to ally yourself with white supremacists around this issue, you will discredit the peace movement with all the communities that, the, that these white supremacists are attacking. Uh, the question that uh, 
A lot of people oftentimes ask me, and that is one for thought, and that's why is it so hard to get white folks involved in eradicating this cancer known as racism? Well, I, I, I think the unfortunate problem is that people do identify uh, with the oppressor uh, around, around this question of skin color. I mean, the work we found is that people will come out on a reactive basis. If they see the Nazis, if they see the Klan, you will see big numbers of people coming out. But the numbers of people who will be proactive and really sustain an effort to, uh, to develop solidarity uh, is much smaller. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, Metzger and those people are out there every day. They've dedicated their lives to racism and to uh, maintaining this system of oppression. And we would certainly like to see more white people uh, taking the opposite side of the coin and dedicate their lives to opposing uh, gay bashing and opposing white supremacy and cross burnings and opposing this kind of anti-immigrant hysteria that's going on. But uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, it, uh, it takes a long time to really cultivate those seeds, I think, and people who would rather, you know, worry about which side their bread is buttered on. Mm -hmm. Now, as you look towards the future, if you was going to sum up the future in a few words, yeah. how does it look on your side of the coin? Um, on our side of the coin, I think it's looking a little better. I, I would have to say that uh, we were, uh, I, we don't believe that you can ma make much change through electoral politics, but I think the, the defeat of George Bush and, and the repudiation of the politics of, of hatred that the Republican Party is really cultivating, uh, you know, where David Duke found a home there, where Pat Buchanan, right. you know, was given uh, prime time to uh, attack uh, lesbians and gays and women and, and uh, minorities and so on. Uh, the fact that that, that that didn't go over I think was a, a positive development. Certainly. The majority rejected it. Yes. And so, uh, you know, I think that lays the basis for people to really uh, take the bull by the horns and, and make a, a, as I say, a more proactive effort to, to cultivate that awakening that might be going on among people that, that, that uh, the politics of hate are, are self-defeating and sterile and destructive of, of uh, any future. Well, I always call the 90s, the 60s upside down, revisited. Yeah looking for some more of that political activism by young people. Uh -huh. And as we wrap up another exciting chapter of the book Beat, Dialogues in Action, I want to thank my guests thank here you. today, okay. Mike Novick. Thank you for the opportunity. All right.